On November 4, 1740, a baby in Farnham, England, was given the formidable name of Augustus Montague Toplady. 
His father, a major in the Royal Marines, had died in war, and his mother, Catherine, spoiled him terribly. His friends often thought him sick and neurotic, and his relatives truly disliked him. But Augustus Toplady was interested in the Lord. I am now arrived at the age of 11 years, he wrote on his birthday. I praise God I can remember no dreadful crime to the Lord be the glory. By age 12, he was preaching sermons to whoever would listen. At 14, he began writing hymns. At 15, he was soundly converted to Christ while attending a barn service conducted by James Morris, a follower of John Wesley. And by 22, Top Lady was ordained an Anglican priest. He and his contemporary, John Wesley, often clashed due to their differences in theology. The great Methodist leader angered Augustus to the point that he once decided to write an article intended to be a slap at Wesley. Augustus extolled God's forgiveness in the article, and in 1776 it was published. It ended with an original poem. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Augustus Top Lady died at age 38. But his poem outlived him and has been called the best known, best loved, and most widely used hymn in the English language. Oddly, it was remarkably similar to something Wesley himself had written nearly 30 years before in the preface of a book of hymns for the Lord's Supper. O rock of salvation, rock struck and cleft for me, let those two streams of blood and water which gush from thy side bring down pardon and holiness into my soul. Perhaps the two men were not as incompatible as they thought.
The Book of Psalms Psalm 72 A Psalm for Solomon Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people, he shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given of the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be an handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Most people assume the Bible has a lot to say about how messed up humans are, and that's true. It's also true that the Bible's vocabulary about this topic sounds odd to modern people, using words like sin, iniquity, or transgression. And so the Bible's perspective on the human condition is often ignored or treated as ancient and backwards. This is really unfortunate. Because through these words, the biblical authors are offering us a deeply profound diagnosis of human nature. Iniquity describes behavior that's crooked, while transgression refers to breaking trust. And sin? This is actually the most common of these bad words in the Bible. So let's focus on it for a few minutes. Sin translates the Hebrew word chata and the Greek word hamartia. The most basic meaning of sin isn't religious at all. Chata simply means to fail or miss the goal. Like when the Israelite tribe of Benjamin trained a small army of slingshot experts, they could sling a stone at a hare and not chata, that is, fail or miss. Or there's a biblical proverb that warns against making hasty decisions because you're likely to chata your way, miss your destination. So in the Bible, sin is a failure to fulfill a goal. But what's the goal? Well, on page one of the Bible, we learn that every human is an image of God a sacred being who represents the Creator and is worthy of respect. And so in this way of seeing the world, sin is a failure to love God and others by not treating them with the honor they deserve. You can see this idea in the famous code of conduct given to the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. Half of them identify ways you can fail at loving God, and the other half name ways you can fail at loving people. 
And the fact that both kinds of failure are combined shows that failing to honor God is deeply connected to failing to honor people. This is why in the Bible, sin against people is sin against God. Like when Joseph refuses to sleep with the wife of Potiphar, he says, how could I sin against God? In Joseph's mind, failing to honor a human made in God's image is a failure to love God. And so, sin is a failure to be truly human. But there's more. A fascinating thing about sin in the Bible is that most of the time that people are failing, they either don't know it or even worse, they think they're succeeding. Like when Pharaoh wants to build Egypt's economy and protect national security, in his mind, this justifies enslaving the Israelites. He thinks it's good and he's totally unaware that it's an epic fail. Or when King Saul is chasing David around the wilderness trying to kill him, he thought he was bringing a criminal to justice until he realizes he's the corrupt one. And he says, I have sinned, I am the failure. So sin is about more than just doing bad things. It describes how we easily deceive ourselves and spin illusions to redefine our bad decisions as good ones. So why are humans such bad judges between moral failure and success? Well, the first appearance of the word sin in the Bible offers an insight. There are these two brothers, Cain and Abel. Their parents had just given in to this beastly temptation to redefine good and evil by their own wisdom, and now Cain is faced with a similar choice. He's jealous and angry that God has favored his brother, and so God warns him, if you don't choose what is good, Chata is crouching at the door, it wants you but you can rule over it. So in these stories, sin or moral failure is depicted as this wild, hungry animal that wants to consume humans. And we know how that story ends. The Bible is trying to tell us that failed human behavior, our tendency towards self-deception, it runs deep. It's rooted in our desires and selfish urges that compel us to act for our own benefit at the expense of others. And it leads to this chain reaction of relational breakdown. This is why in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul describes hamartia as a power or a force that rules humans. In his words, we are slaves to sin. He even says sin lives in us so that the things I don't want to do, that's what I do. So with the word sin, the biblical authors are offering a robust description of the human condition. It's a failure to be humans who fully love God and others. It's our inability to judge whether we're succeeding or failing. And it's that deep, selfish impulse that drives much of our behavior. This is not a pretty picture of ourselves, but if we're honest, it's realistic. This is why in the Bible, the story of Jesus is such good news. He's depicted as the creator become a truly human one who did not fail to love God and others. That is, he did not sin. And yet, he took responsibility for humanity's history of failure. He lived for others and he died for their sins. And he was raised from the dead to offer them the gift of his life that covers for their failures. Or in the words of the apostles, he committed no sin, yet he carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our sins and live to do what is right. And that's the story behind the biblical word for sin. up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, say
Judges chapter 3 this morning, if you would, in your Bibles. Judges chapter 3. There we go. Judges chapter 3. We'll read here this morning verse 31, and it's the only verse 
for for this judge. Well, technically the only verse here. Uh, there's one other verse we'll cover later. Uh, but Judges chapter 3, verse 31, there we read, And after him, and the him here is Ehud, after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text of Scripture. We're thankful that we've been able to come this morning to sing hymns of the faith and to be have our hearts stirred with truths from those hymns. And this morning, as we take a look at this text of Scripture, this one character, Shamgar, and what little we know about him, and yet you've seen fit to preserve his story here in Scripture. And as we take a look this morning at this snippet of a character, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to truth. Would you minister to each of our hearts exactly what we need here this morning? We ask this in your son's name. Amen. When approaching this character of scripture, I think a good way to think about it is human nature, we actually enjoy a little bit of mystery. Um, whether we would like to admit that or not, most of us do enjoy a little bit of mystery, which is why certain groups and certain people will get into a certain story. Maybe it's a book series. Maybe it's a movie series. And they're always intrigued. What's going to happen with this character next? Or what's going to happen? And there's anticipation that builds for the next. And so as humans, we, we enjoy history or, or mystery. We enjoy figuring out the pieces. And I sometimes wonder if God drops a few things in Scripture that are for us to ponder and go, hmm, I'm not sure. <laughs> and and they get our, our thoughts turning and our our wheels turning and as we engage with that text and other texts of Scripture. And so sometimes we don't always have a definitive answer for some of the nuanced little things. But they do get us to think through the rest of the Bible and to put the story of the Bible together. By way of introduction again, to, as a reminder, bringing us back, we have Joshua conquers the land, then in Judges and Ruth we have the time period where they really should be settling the land and, and moving forward there. That enters in, into the first, second Samuel, which is preparing for the kings. So we have first, second kings, and I finally added to the slide first, second chronicles, which kind of goes along with that. So, yeah, anything previous could have been edited, but we'll go from there. The book of Judges falls into three fairly neat sections. Chapters 1 and 2 describe the problem of how they failed to drive out the Canaanites. Chapters 3 to 16 give us the corruption of the judges and, and kind of a downward spiral. And the last two chapters as well as the book of Ruth, have a corruption of God's people and some stories that go along with that. We're currently in a, a smaller section of Judges, chapters 3 to 5, where the three major judges are Othniel, Ehud, and, and Deborah. However, we have this morning Shamgar, who some people put him as a appendix to Ehud. Others put him more as a contemporary of Deborah and Barak. Well, yeah, he's that. He gets a little add-on here. There's one Interesting point, that there's a couple Septuagint manuscripts that have this verse actually at the end of the Samson story. And so I'm not sure what's happening there and why. Um, however, as you think of Ehud, or I'm sorry, I'm getting all these names mixed up. As you think of Shamgar, what happens in Shamgar's story does kind of sound like some of the things that happen in Samson's story. So there may be some deliberate connections here. We have looked at this cycle of sin and then oppression and repentance and peace and how time and time again God will announce uh, the, that his people have sinned. God responds by letting them be oppressed. Then we have a, usually a statement of how long they're oppressed. Israel cries out to the Lord. God raises a deliverer to deliver them. They have peace for so many years and then the cycle repeats. And we've seen that played out already with Othniel. The oppressor was uh, the Mesopotamian king, Cusheth Rishashayim. That was eight years, 40 years of rest afterwards. We see it with Ehud, where the oppressor was Eglon and Moab. He was oppressed for 18 years, and then they had 80 years of rest. But when we come to Shamgar, we know this. He, the oppressor was the Philistines. We don't know anything else. <laughs> Doesn't t all the normal formulas on Sham for all the judges, it's, it's not here for Shamgar. It's just gone. Like, it, it, there's nothing to it. So let's dig into Shamgar and see what we can find here on Shamgar. Now, with how I've prepped this, I found this one quote. I thought it was just, it fit well. In, in talking about this verse, he said, this one verse 
has occasioned some of the longest judges articles. Why? Because there's a lot of mystery. There's a lot. We don't know what's going on with this judge. And so when you have academic people writing lots of articles and lots of speculation, they get long very quickly. So with that, we're going to dive in here to what we, we can and do know. Uh, as a, we look at a kind of a map of Israel, we'll see that Othniel, he faced his threat from the north, even though he's from the south. Um, Kushath Rishashem came from the north. Ehud was facing Moab, which is over to the east of where they were. Um, now Shamgar, this is uh, he, he delivered Israel from the Philistines, and the shaded in area is, is about where the Philistines kind of settled and where they kind of controlled the territory. But if you notice on the map, Shamgar's listed twice. Anybody notice that? I have it circled down south, but it's also listed up north. We're not really sure where this guy's from. And we'll get into that more in a bit later. I will say this, the Othniel, he had saved Israel from a distant enemy. Ehud saved his people from a neighboring enemy. And Shamgar's delivering from the Philistines. That's the first of the nations mentioned here in chapter 3. So if you remember back to the top of chapter 3. Oh, I had it there and I took it away. I'm sorry. It says, only that generation of the children of Israel to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof, namely the five lords of the Philistines. And it lists other nations as well. So we're jumping in here with this, this Philistines. Is, they're listed at the beginning of this chapter. They're then listed now in the end of the chapter when Shamgar will face them. So let's just dive into the verse and, and look at what we have. We've already talked about how all the normal setting, all the cycle that normally is there for all the other judges, it's, it's just not there for Shamgar. So we can get rid of that graphic. We'll use that later <laughs> for the next judge. So we have here... Um, We, we know from another verse of scripture, a couple of chapters later, in chapter 5, it says, In the days of Shangar, the son of Anath, in the days of jail, the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through byways. These are the only two verses in our Bibles that mention Shamgar. Chapter 5 of Judges is in the middle of a poetic psalm, where Deborah, and Bar Deborah has composed this psalm um, about their victories. And so we see this connection, Ehud... Shamgar, um, Deborah, Barak, Jail, they're kind of all overlapping in the same time frame. But we have this description of the highways were unoccupied. In essence here, the oppressors, at this point the Philistines in the story, because they are in domination of the land, you're not going to take the main routes. You're going to sneak around the back ways. So Israel is living in fear, and that we have a little description here of what's going on in Shamgar's day. Israel is living in fear because of their oppressors. Now, what we have in chapter 3, verse 31, uh, it raises several questions. Who is this man Shamgar? How did he emerge a champion of Israel? Um, how did he do what he did with an ox goat? Well, we're going to look into what we can find out here this morning and go from there. First of all, let's take note of his name. It's not an Israelite name. You say, well, how do you know whether it's an Israelite name or not? I'm no Hebrew scholar, all right? So I can only read what others write. Hebrew words are based on three major consonants in each word. Shamgar has four major consonants in the word, which clues those who know Hebrew off that, hey, this is a name imported from another culture or language. This is a name that's not native to Israel um, and so and to, to Hebrew. So um, they've looked at that and they've said, look, his name, it's not a Hebrew name. Also, if you look at what his name means, it can either mean cupbearer or it can mean sword. Either would be an interesting application in that he ser Shamgar serves as the cupbearer or the one who pours out God's wrath. Um, on God's enemies, or he's the sword in the hand of the Lord. Um, you could go either way. That's what his name could or might mean. Um, but there again, which one's right? Is it cup? Is it sword? I don't know. We have this description. He says, the son of Anath. Well, that right there has a whole bunch of articles just on that little phrase. Um, 
First, m the most common historical interpretation of this was he was from Ben Anath, which is in northern Galilee. So if you see the square on the map, I've kind of blown that up for you. There's a city up in northern uh, Israel with that name. Now, that's why on that first map I showed, they have Shamgar up north. They think he's from the north. The weird thing about that is the Philistines were invading in the south. So that doesn't necessarily make sense, although I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, some would think that it was the name of his either father or his mother. That's possible as well. Uh, it also could mean, um, son of Anat is also could be a reference to a Canaanite goddess. Uh, this was the goddess of war and, and fertility. And so there might be connections there in that he was actually possibly a worshiper of a Canaanite god. Now remember, the period of Judges, this is a bad spot in Israel's history. And every time we turn around, they're, they're worshiping other gods. And if he's not even an Israelite, he could be just a Canaanite living in the land who's worshiping a false god, but who God still uses to deliver his people. Um, lastly here, there's some that take um, that he was actually part of an Egyptian military group that was called the Troop of Anath. So this goddess of Anath, she had become popular even down in Egypt, and there was a military troop that took that name. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either, because if he was a military guy, why would he be fighting with an ox goad? Okay? So, so I know I'm throwing all these things out. Like, what is happening with this verse? And that's okay. Let it kind of sit and like, hmm, just ponder what is going on. We have then here um, what he did or accomplished. It says, which slew the Philistines, of the Philistines, 600 men. Now that becomes another question. Were these 600 men all killed at the same time? Were they killed over a period of time? Did he kill them by himself, or did he have a troop of men with him? You say, well, it sounds like he killed them by himself. That's true. But then it talks about David killing his tens of thousands, and we know that he had a troop with him. So it could go either way. It doesn't matter. There is a point to be made, though. God was with him. God used him. Um, the Philistines here, they are a sea people. They're beginning to invade they had already actually tried to invade, historically, they had tried to invade Egypt and failed. So they went up the coast a ways to what we saw on the map a little earlier, and they started invading there. So in the, in the period of Judges, Shamgar is pretty early. They haven't set up their cities and strongholds as much yet. They're just now stepping into the land and trying to, to get control. He's there to face them. So, again, as the questions I pose, was he alone? Was this one event or a series of battles. Who are these Philistines? And again, we go back to, they were mentioned earlier in this chapter. They had control of this region over time. We don't really know a lot about them. Lastly, or I shouldn't say lastly, next. How's that? He did it with an ox goad. Now, that has led many people to speculate he's a farmer. Possible? It's a good, it's a good guess. An ox goad this is the best picture I could find. The irony to me is how, how commentators and, and preachers describe an ox goad does not match this ox goad. But when you pull up the pictures of ox goads in that time, this, this is what you get. So I'll give you both and you can sort it out. It was a tool. Ultimately, it was used for two purposes. One, you would poke the cattle or, or the livestock in front of you to keep them or get them moving when they decided they didn't want to move. Thus, it would have a point on one end, usually dipped in metal and, and, and hardened on that end, uh, for keeping the cattle moving. But it would also have a chisel, or in this case, kind of looks like a hook, for when the plow would get clogs of dirt and whatever on it, it was something that you could pry off of it. Um, now, preachers seem to always describe the chisel as being at the complete other end, and I don't know why. I... I'm not an archaeologist, so this would be a question I'd have to ask somebody who's in that field. But nonetheless, it's a farming tool. It's not a sword. It's not a spear. Although, you know, it kind of resembles the shape of a spear a bit. It's a farming implement. And that's what he used. And God gave him the victory with a farming instrument. And against 600 men. So, so if it's if this happens at one instance, and all 600 were killed with this, if this happens over a period of time, then maybe he was carrying this thing around. 
Some have thought that maybe there was a connection here between this instrument being used simply as a way to demonstrate the futility of God's, or the futility of fighting against a superior power. It doesn't matter if you come against the Lord with, or his people with a sword or a shield or whatever it is. Whatever's in their hands with God behind them, they have the victory. Now that would be a theme that we'd seen through Joshua, where they conquered the land. They were the underdogs. They were the ones who described themselves as grasshoppers in the sight of giants. And God gave them the victory. So there, there could be some hope here to that in that um, this ox goat may become a symbol, something he fought with. Much like there's been through history some military individuals who get cocky a little bit. Um, in, uh, Mad Jack always wore like the feather in his cap in World War II. Uh, if you read the story of Andrew, um, brother, brother Andrew, when he was fighting in, in uh, Indonesia, he got tired of fighting and he started wearing this orange or yellow straw hat everywhere. Yes, it was bad military. Yes, it, it didn't blend in. It was in camouflage, but he didn't care. Maybe Shamgar is, hey, he doesn't care. This is his weapon. I don't know. And I realize I don't know, but I'm being honest that I don't know. Because I've watched a lot of sermons on Shamgar this week, and they sure know a lot about what they don't know. <laughs> and it drives me nuts, because like, well, he was a farmer. And it's like, well, maybe. <laughs> he was from here. I'm like, well, maybe. <laughs> um, but there, there is a point I, I am driving to, even with these questions. We, the, why an ox goad? We, we don't know. I'm just, I'm enjoying preaching, so I'm not sticking with the PowerPoint as much this morning. It says here, and he also delivered... Israel. There's one other thing to note here. Delivered. He didn't judge. The writer of Judges uses a different word here for delivered Israel. He doesn't use a word that typically gets used with several of the other judges. And yes, even the word for judge or rule doesn't always mean they, they sat and judged. It can mean deliver. But they deliberately use here a word that really means just he saved or delivered Israel. Now, let's run through this. Let's say that Shamgar is not an Israelite. Let's assume that he's not even a worshiper of Yahweh. Can God use someone like that to deliver his people? God can do what he wants with who he wants. There's an old saying that the enemy of my enemy is often my friend. Now, God can use who he wants. The Philistines were a threat to Israel, and there's nothing to say that God didn't raise up Shamgar as one to deliver Israel, even though he wasn't an Israelite. Now, could he have been an Israelite? Sure. I'm not going to throw that out. We just don't know. But that leaves me with something I think ought to be considered here. Daniel Block, in his commentary, kind of thinks about this, and he says, it's, it's interesting that in the book of Judges, the writer of Judges would include this judge and include him in a very short way, in a way that doesn't fit the pattern. And his speculation, and I'm telling you, his speculation is that the author of Judges was embarrassed to have someone outside of Israel saving God's people. Now think about that. If he's right, and again, we're a little into speculation here, I'm telling you that. Shouldn't we also, as a church, as believers... Be embarrassed when unbelievers outdo us? What, what do I mean? Well, when their acts of kindness and their way of, of reaching out and caring for their neighbors and the way they pour their lives into others, when that it is at least seems to do more than what your efforts and mine efforts are, shouldn't that put us to shame? Now, maybe, maybe this is all wrong. Maybe he was an Israelite. Maybe he was a worshiper of Yahweh. But there is something to consider there. If you or I claim to be a follower of the Lord, it should we should find it awkward. It should embarrass us when the church becomes dependent on the, the mode of doing things like the world. When the way we want to necessarily grow a church is like by a business model or the, the way we think we need to progress is by, well, this is what happens. In fact, that's probably why this came to mind. The Lord, The conversation in the dental office was about how church in their settings, which was neither one of which was talking was a Baptist, church has become nothing um, in, in some of their search than, than a party or, or a 
an expression of people having fun. And, and the Catholic there is like, well, church, you should be going there to honor God. It's not about you. And I'm like, yes, there's something to that. And the other, the lady there was like, well, but my kids really can't stand going to this church, you know, because it's like this or that. And my conclusion was fairly simple to them. I said, look, the Ten Commandments are split, not quite 50-50, but four of them deal with honoring God and six of them deal with our relationship with others. And I said, if you, if you go to church and you get absolutely nothing out of it, i.e. because it's in Latin, <laughs> you know, the, like the Catholics used to do where it's Latin Mass, and we all would show up to hear a Latin sermon that none of us knew Latin, so it just meant nothing to us. I said, that's not really profitable. But if church is nothing more than we're doing everything I want to do, we're, we're satisfying my needs and what makes me feel good, then it's become human-centered, not God-centered. And when you and I come together for church, you should be encouraged. You should be encouraged by those around you as you interact and speak to them. You should be encouraged from God's Word. It should speak to you from the hymns that we sing. But also, in your singing, you're glorifying God. In your hearing God's Word and, and opening your heart to respond, you're glorifying God. You're worshiping Him. You're, you're giving Him the credit due for who He is. And so we as Christians, I believe, we should live as if God is seated on the throne and live by faith. And maybe if Shamgar here was an outsider outside of Israel, maybe we need to recognize sometimes God's using unbelievers, even in our lives, to prod or prompt us. Now, that doesn't mean they're God. everything they say is right or true. Or not everything you or I say is right or true. But as we kind of think through this, um, I want to mention this quote. God is resourceful and often rescues his work through outside agents in spite of his people and their leaders. When we read the story of Esther, Mordecai says to Esther early on in the story, as she's confronted with what, what she needs to do, Mordecai essentially says, if you don't do this, God will raise up someone else who will. And you and I have been placed where we are by God. You and I have been given the gifts and the talents we have by God. You and I have, have the connections with other people and the relationships we have. We can start there. Many of the sermons I listen to on, uh, on Shamgar here, because I was having a hard time figuring out how to preach Shamgar. They'd have an outline something like this. Start where you are. Use what you have and do what you can. That's a great preaching sermon. It's a great way to apply. And we should start where we are. Use what we uh, have and do what we can. I'm not sure an ancient Israelite would have quite got that out of the text. But let me put, this, put it this way. Shamgar was a tool in God's hand. The ox goad was a tool in Shamgar's hand. Victory wasn't because of Shamgar or an ox goad. Victory was because God was accomplishing his plan through Shamgar. And victory often comes from unexpected sources. And so, when your life and mine, when the dust of our lives have settled, what will we be remembered for? As we think through the, the kind of mysterious life of Shangar, we know it was tumultuous times. We know this little bit about him, but because of history and time, we're not sure all the details, but did he deliver Israel? Did God use him? Yes. And when your life or mine has settled out and the dust has mattered, and a hundred years later, when someone, for some reason, is doing a book and they're researching your life and they're trying to figure out the good, the bad, and the ugly, what will be the thing that's said of you? Of Shamgar, it's he delivered Israel. He had that victory. Yes, he was enabled by God. Yes, God was using him. But how has God used you? And how does God want to use you? this week. So, Shamgar, we, again, don't know a lot about this guy. But what, but what we do know, God is the deliverer and we can look to him for all of our problems this week and forever in the future. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. And as I have attempted to approach and, and, and tackle this one verse in dealing with Shamgar, 
a person who, from his name to his heritage to the weapon he used, just mystery to us, seems to surround this text. And it's a verse that often, as we read the Bible, it's so quick we can just miss it. But it has a powerful le lesson that you're not limited in who you use. And although at times we may feel like we are a nobody and nothing from nowhere, God, you use people. Sometimes you use by working through them. Sometimes you use them in spite of who they are. And if we are surrendered to your heart and your will and your desires, and if we are seeking to do what's right, surely you desire to work through us, even though we are broken tools, even though we are a farm implement being carried to battle. You're the God of the impossible. You're the God who delights in using the weak and foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And Lord, this week, as we face tests and trials, would we not look at the problem as much as we look to our Savior? Would we rest in who you are and trust you? Not simply place our hope and our faith in our own understanding. Lord, would you even allow us this week as people maybe outside the church have spoken even truth into our lives. Truth that happens to line up from Scripture. Lord, I ask that you would make us a people who are molded and shaped by Scripture, but a people who are sensitive to hear how you want our hearts and lives to be changed. With heads bowed and eyes closed as Mrs. Driscoll begins to play a hymn of invitation. Simply do business with the Lord. Will you let him rule and reign in your life this week? I pray that it would be God working through you, not in spite of you. You look up this way. I trust you've had some time to do business with the Lord. Shamgar is one of those obscure heroes in Scripture. He's on the page and off the page within just a couple verses. And your life and mine and the whole scope of history, we're on the page and off the page really quickly. Most of us will not have books written about us. But our lives can still matter and still pack, impact others for Christ. Lord, we thank you for the life of Shamgar. And though we don't have a lot of details, the hero of this story is not a man, but it's you. And this week, may we live as though the hero of our lives is not our own abilities, but you. May that be a practical reality that each of us, by faith, accept this week. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.